So we have our next panel. Uh, moderation uh, does Anna Lena, and we have with the theme "Future of Healthcare Apps" Maya Kidron. Right. So give her a welcome. Thank you. Hi. Oh, Mike Merks. Perfect. Yeah. Um, your welcome was like uh, you just came back from lunch. <laughs> so maybe we can repeat this. Can you please give a big hand for Maya? Thank you. That's nice. She, f she flew in from Berlin. And uh, Maya, I know that you have a lot of experiences in product teams. She's really, she's a product hero, superhero. <laughs> um, can you give us a brief overview of your journey in product teams? Sure. So I actually started my first uh, product management position. It was probably around um, 13 years ago. Um, and I went to this company called DBMotion, which what they did was they created this integrated uh, patient file. And um, actually, it was a very interesting company. It was uh, not exactly a startup, a little bigger than that. But they never had a product manager before. So they had no product management established there. And that was my first role as a product manager. So if there's a tip I can give you, don't start your product management career in a company that never had product management. <laughs> uh, your chances of succeeding are probably uh, a lot lower than if you go to a place that tried it before. Um, but it did teach me a lot. So it was a good lesson in humility. Um, and also, I learned a lot of interesting things about how to work with the stakeholders in the company and what's important. And after that, I really felt that I needed um, a place where you have more established processes, which is something that I never felt the need for before that. So I started working for SAP, and um, I've been with SAP for 10 years now, which is much longer than I ever anticipated. And I worked in, on different products there, um, really in different stages. So, very interesting experience. What kind of products did you work on? Hmm. Well, when I started working in SAP, I worked uh, on a product called Real-Time Offer Management, which was this rule-based engine that provided recommendations for retail or banking for next best action. Uh, and that was a very, you know, very interesting experience. Actually, when I started working in SAP, uh, we worked in a waterfall model and my job was to take that product and turn it into part of the CRM system, the SAP huge CRM system, and it worked in 18-month cycles. So I would write this, like, this thick specs for what do I expect to get out of it. The development team would take it, weigh it, and say, OK, we need 12 months to do it. I'd say, OK. And um, we'd start going, and hopefully somewhere at the end, you would get something close to what you wanted to get and at, yeah, at the timeline. Uh, and now it's completely different. I mean, the product that I'm working on are cloud products. We release every two to four weeks. So I really went through the whole transformation in SAP from kind of hardcore waterfall to super agile. Um, yeah. You work on healthcare products, right? Right. Now I work at the Innovation Center in the Health Application Hub. So what we do is we work with different um, hospitals and healthcare providers on developing new applications in the healthcare domain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And compared to the CRM stuff, what's different in developing healthcare products? Yeah. What do you need to do differently? Yeah, it's very different. So first of all, uh, in the CRM, I worked on an existing product. So it's very different to work on something that is already there and just try to add features on top of it versus going into a completely new domain and um, trying to develop things really from scratch. Um, so the whole experience and the processes that you need to do and the way you work and the type of people that you need to have on your team in order to support that are very, very different. So you have to have a team that is very agile, that is very flexible. You have to have people that are um, able to work on different things. And, and also maybe one of the things we learned is that uh, while SAP might have some customers in the healthcare domain, so you say, okay, we sell ERP to healthcare, but actually when you're going to the clinical domain, um, then you don't know anyone in, the, in those companies that handles the clinical domain. You don't have the right context there. You, need to, you don't need to talk to IT. 
you need to talk to the clinical people, and you actually have to establish all that network and all those connections and work together with the salespeople and everyone, really, because this is really like going into a completely new market that you've never been in before. Okay, and I think if it's a healthcare product, it's about people's lives, so it right. needs to be perfect. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with that? Yeah, well, um, it's very hard to do something that is completely perfect. So maybe I'll say a little more about um, the type of products that we are working on. So we're working on products that are mainly data-based. So what we try to do is um, use all the data that is available in the different systems and in the different organizations and really try to take it and bring it to the right context at the right time in order to improve the care. Um, so first of all, the data is another thing we discovered that the healthcare data is in very, very poor quality. And I mean, you would expect it to be different, but actually when you start collecting the data, we, at the beginning we thought, okay, the first problem, just let's collect the data. Okay, we collect the data, it's there, okay, we have unstructured data, okay, let's collect the unstructured data. Uh, we need to do NLP and get the right, uh, um, you know, extract the right um, data from these documents. You do that, and, and then you have the different, uh, like different coding systems for healthcare. So you need to align all the coding system. Okay, so you do that, and then what do you find out? You did your whole process perfectly, but the data in the system is not right. It's not accurate. It has a lot of conflict. So you actually have to go through another process of really cleaning up the data, and and you know trying to bring it to. Uh, a good level and a good state that you can actually get insights from it. So it's really like a very long process that you have to go through in order just to get to bring the data, and that's even before you started with the first use case, that what are you actually going to do with that data. How um, long did that take? How long was the process? Um, well, it's an iterative process, right? So you start with the first thing, and then you discover the next problem and the next problem and so on. Uh, so I would say now, I think it took us about... Uh, two years with, you know, again, working with customers and going through the processes until you got to a stage where you really had data in the systems that was in a good enough state that you could actually really use to get insights. And two years is not with kind of one customer, it's really starting the whole process and then working on it together with the customers and, you know, uh, understanding what their problems are and going through the data and improving, you know, and adding stuff and so on. So it's a long process, but also the sales cycles in, in healthcare are mm -hmm. very, very long. It's not um, a few months, it can get up to one and a half, two years. So Okay, so two years for just getting ready to develop a product that is no, super no. complex? Two years until we got it in a state where you could actually use it to bring insight. So of course, if you have okay. a new customer now, uh, you would need a few months to integrate the data, but you don't need two years because we already learned, we already mm -hmm. know, we already have the right pieces of the puzzle there and the right processes. Um, Maybe we can yeah. go a little bit deeper into the development process because sure. I think there are so many product managers here, I think. So h how do you cope with that, that need for perfection? Yeah, and with a team, you need to do that. Yeah, right. So... Um, that's true that in healthcare, you have a lot more responsibility. Um, and even just to start the developing process, even if you know exactly what you need to do, you still have all the regulations that are around that on how do you maintain the data, how do you keep it, who owns the data, how do you you know, save the data, who has access to it, how do you log everything that is related to it. And there are very clear regulations about it in different countries. Um, so it's not really something that you can say, okay, let's try that, let's put up something in two months and you know, see how it works, it works great, it doesn't, it doesn't. So you really have to have the right infrastructure to allow you to even handle uh, clinical data uh, in a way that is legal and compliant and you know, respects all the rules and regulations that you have. Um, so actually, uh, one of the lucky things is that we're working in the innovation center, so we have a lot of freedom in choosing uh, the platforms that we're working on, even though it's an SAP, right? Um, so, for example, SAP has a cloud platform, but we're actually starting, usually starting on AWS, because AWS have the HIPAA compliant platform, so HIPAA is the US regulation on how to maintain uh, data, uh, clinical data, um, and the SAP platform is not. So, uh, well, not now, they have plans to do it, it will take 
probably another half year until they do it. But if we would have waited for them to be compliant and only then started, then the whole thing would have been delayed. So what we do is we take whatever we can, we start with something, we do the learning process, maybe on something that we know we would not be able to actually productize in SAP uh, as it is, but we understand the product, we understand how it needs to work. And then later, when the SAP part is mature enough and catches up to the needs that we have, then we migrate it to the SAP platform and there we can productize it and sell it to the customers. Okay, so you start with a technology that is ready and compliant right. enough, and uh, on the, in the parallel stage, you develop your own technology for that at SAP. Right. So I, I guess everyone that worked with with developers know that you know every two months they want to do a rewrite, right? So let's throw away everything we did. It's horrible. Let's start from scratch. And you know, I remember at the beginning as a product manager, it would just drive me crazy. I was like, never, never say you know, uh, say that to me. I mean, that's, I just needed to work and just leave me, I don't care about the architecture. But the fact is that when you do innovation and when you work and, you know, you develop stuff, sometimes it really does make sense to, you know, kind of take everything you learned and start over, uh, at least from the technological perspective, um, once you understood how it actually needs to work and with everything you've learned and with the new technologies that are available and with the better understanding of the needs, so you really get to do it right. So in a sense, you know, maybe at the beginning we saw it as some sort of burden, but now we see the advantage of it because you really get to kind of do it right so mm -hmm. you can do it right again half a year later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's get to your development process. What kind of, of tools do you use, yeah, and uh, how do you work with your team to get it right? Yeah, so uh, this is also something that has been very, very different. So I worked mm -hmm. in on four, I released four products in SAP, um, which is really like <laughs> truly exceptional. Um, and every time I worked with a different team and a different setup. Um, so currently we're working at the Innovation Center and uh, we're working, theoretically we're working agile, but it's really kind of a agile that is right for our needs. Um, so we have the you know, daily stand-ups and we have, um, we have the uh, retro and review and all of those, but because the people I have on my team are super talented and super motivated and really have a lot of skills that allows me as a product manager to kind of step into, you know, maybe dedicate less attention to the backlog refinement and all that work because once I understand, you know, what it's, we make sure that we are all aligned and we understand what we need to achieve there, then if there is someone else in the team that can do it as well as me, why should I do that? I can go and work on more customer facing things. I can work more on the value proposition. I can work more with the stakeholders and with the customers. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of really important to understand. What are the assets that you have? What are the skills that you have? Because as, as a product manager, you're kind of a mini CEO, right? So you're responsible that everything works well. But you know, if you really want everything to work well, then your job is to make sure that there are, you know, there are no voids, that everything, you know, everything is covered well. And if you have people who have good skills that maybe are you know, officially a product manager skills, but they're good at it, you know, as good as you, and I mean, you need your time to do something else, then let them do that. Actually, it's an opportunity for you to train the next product manager, right? And let people mm -hmm. grow and really free up your time to handle places where there might be a need. And, you know, even that need could be under someone else's umbrella, but if it's not covered, go ahead and cover it, because, I mean, you want to make sure that everything is done correctly and the process is working. So you really look at what you have, mm -hmm. and then you build your, pro uh, your process? Well, you usually start with something, right? So you start with Agile, and then you see, OK, where do they need me more? Where do they need me less? In some places, I would have to, you know, I had teams where I would really have to define the backlog to, to the smallest detail. Like, we would do these backlog refinements. We would, you know, the, we would have acceptance for the back backlog items. They would reject backlog items because the icon wasn't ready at the design team, so I cannot accept it because I don't know if I can deliver it on time. Um, so I had these experiences <laughs> as well. So you really have to, again, understand who are the people that you have in front of you, what are their needs, what do they need to do their work properly, what are the needs that you have in this process, and, and really to make sure that everything works well. But I think this is kind of a privilege I have because I worked in so many teams and so many setups 
that I really like. I really don't care so much about the title and about you know this is my decision, not yours. And I can really have a more holistic view of it, um, which I think helps me kind of get better results end to end. How often do you review and also rethink the process you're working in at the moment? Oh, we do that all the time. So um, we have retrospectives, which are kind of officially running every, again, depends on the team, every two to four weeks. We actually started doing something really interesting and nice, which one of the developers brought it up. He read it somewhere. We do experiments. So at the beginning, we had these retros where everyone would put their sticky notes. This is not working. Okay, we vote. We you know, try to handle everything. At the end, you handle almost nothing because you can't handle 20 problems at the same time. Then you say, okay, we start with the most important ones. And, but, but then what we did was we're trying this experiment thing where people suggest experiments, all right? Um, so let's say, um, for example, we say, um, I don't know, the, um, um, we don't have, we need to have people review other people's code and they don't do it, okay? Uh, or they don't do it fast enough. So what do we do? So someone uh, suggests an experiment. Let's say now we try this process. I mean, you know, everyone has to take one code review a week, uh, da, 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 da. Um, and people vote whether or not they want to try that experiment, and you try that experiment and it either works or, you know, it fails. And then, you know, you, so instead of kind of sitting and trying to define what is the perfect process to solve this problem and, you know, wasting hours of teams and meetings about it, you just try something, yeah? You try something and you usually learn so much more just through trying and experimenting than from trying to define the perfect process from the beginning because that's usually very difficult and and not the most efficient way to do it. What kind of solutions did you find through that experimenting? That might be super interesting. Oh my God, I, I'm a little ashamed to say that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so maybe I should uh, also mention that I'm not only a product manager now, so um, a couple of months ago, uh, I also took on the role of development manager, uh, which means that I'm a product manager, but I'm also I'm managing a development team. Um, and then in the retros, um, you know, we would bring up issues, but there was a feeling that maybe now some people don't feel comfortable bringing up some issues because I'm there. So we did an experiment where I was no longer participating in the retrospectives <laughs> uh, to run it and to see whether they actually feel more comfortable, have more transparency, and again, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that if you have really a lot of years of experience, then you don't, I mean, you understand the process needs to work, nothing is personal. But I have to say, you know, maybe I should say that at the end, this experiment failed in the sense they that... They need you. They <laughs> need me there. I mean, they want me there, more important. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so, so you can really throw anything out there and try it. And that's, I mean, it seems to be working very well now. I'm not sure if you answered my question because you told us what didn't work out <laughs> through All the right. experiments. What worked? Was there anything that was surprising or new that you can tell the audience like to take it home and try it next week? Well, yeah, I can, I can give some examples uh, to things. Yeah, it's, well, let me think. I mean, there were a lot of things that I can talk about, like, you know, okay, like this uh, review process that we did with the... Uh, um, um, with people on the team and so on, but I don't think it really matters, I mean, that specific point. I think if there is a message that I want to get through is the fact that just try stuff. I mean, you know, it, I'm not saying don't talk about it and don't try to, you know, reach a process, but don't get caught up in let's have 20 mini meetings until everyone agrees on every item, on every corner case, what happens if this doesn't happen? Take something, not perfect, try it, iterate on it, you'll get a better result with the same amount of time than if you would have just sat and tried to define it perfectly from, from the beginning. When we prepped this, uh, you said something great, and I want to repeat it because you don't say it. It's like, don't be religious. Right. I love right. that. Don't be religious about the process, and that really stick to my mind because it's like I can touch this Yeah, phrase. absolutely. I mean, I think when people talk, a lot of people talk about, you know, we want to do the perfect scrum and be super agile, and I'm like, why do you want to do the perfect scrum? I mean, 
Scrum is not a goal, it's a method that is supposed to bring you to a certain goal. And your goal is to have an effective development mm -hmm. process. Uh, and uh, I mean, even if you practice Scrum just by the book, it doesn't mean that you're, you have an effective uh, process that everyone are happy about and that maximizes the resources that you have. So you need to find what's right for you. And also, I mean, are you working on a completely new product? Are you working on a product that exists? Uh, I mean, uh, what, what stage are you in? Are you working with a market? Do you have access to customers? Don't you have access to customers? Do you have uh, a team where every developer can pick up any item? Or do you have a team where people are specializing and, you know, like you have this super expert uh, um, UI developer that, you know, is just so good at that and doesn't want to do anything else? Are you going to force him to, you know, do backend just because this is what the process does and everyone takes everything? So, I mean, again, you need to understand what you have, what are the resources you have, what is, you know, like the best way for you to utilize these resources and build a process that serves that. And maybe it's Scrum, maybe it's a variation of Scrum, maybe it's something completely different. It really doesn't matter. I mean, what you need to, again, remember is what are your needs. I had teams where I would, you know, I would be part of a big product, yeah, and we would provide services to other teams. We would do the planning for everyone. I had to be super accurate about when I deliver what. Yeah, so this was really in order for the machine to work, you had to be able to say, okay, this month you're going to get this feature, next month you're going to get this feature, and so on. You had to be able to plan that. Of course, when you work like that, it's very, very important to be able to predict how much time it would take you mm -hmm. to develop everything. But in some cases, if you're working on something completely new, you're doing co-innovation with a customer, you try stuff, some of it works, some of it doesn't, you have no idea what, you know, what you're going to develop three months from now, why do you have to spend the hours, you know, in order to kind of be super accurate about what you deliver when? It's not important at this stage, right? So again, it's, it's, there's no like one size fits all. You really have to find the right process to serve your needs at that time. I think that's a perfect word to close our <laughs> interview and sure. open the uh, audience for questions. Who had the first question? People are so overwhelmed by your wis wisdom, so they don't I know just, what to I, ask. No more questions, I know. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly! <laughs> uh, hello, uh, my name is Hardik, and I work for a venture capitalist firm. Is this a mic or my voice? Yeah, uh, anyway, uh, I th you told us that you work for an innovation center, so right. it will be very valuable if you can tell um, what issues in this industry can be improved with more health tech ventures or something like? Yeah, right. I did, we didn't really touch the healthcare stuff, right? Not, not <laughs> so much. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, the healthcare industry is really a place where you have this huge potential for really doing a lot of very significant good and changing processes, but it's an extremely complex place. Um, I don't think I understood how complex it is before I started working there. Um, so I think, you know, if we look at the, at the trends, and also I think the industry is kind of maturing a bit there. And if before we really talked about uh, replacing the physicians and, you know, someone else would make the decision, I think we're kind of moving away from that to a place where you complement the, the decisions that the physician make. Because... Uh, there are a few reasons for that. First of all, it seems like it's not so easy to give good predictions for treatments uh, as people thought it might be. So it's a lot more complicated. Also, the black box kind of, you know, this is our recommendation, take it, uh, doesn't really work in the healthcare industry where you have to justify, um, you know, you have to explain why you are giving a certain recommendation and why it needs to be done. Uh, and also, um, physicians provide a lot more than just a care recommendation. And there is a saying that, you know, like, uh, any physician that can be replaced by uh, uh, software deserves to be replaced by software, right? So, I mean, y you have to deliver more than that. Um, so I think we see a lot of move towards complementing the physicians rather than replacing them. And another thing, I, th I think we're going to see a lot of move from kind of, you know, like... Um, uh, patient or customer-oriented only 
applications to things that actually require the engagement of the healthcare system and providers because you can only go so far by collecting your own medical data because what are you going to do with it? I mean, you can't treat yourself based on that. I mean, you have to take it to the physician and have him accept it and give a recommendation. So another thing we're seeing is that, you know, like these consumer um, applications are kind of moving towards, you know, B2B, more inclusive, to find something that would allow you to take that data from the end user, but actually integrate it into the healthcare um, care organization where, where it can actually have the impact. Well, it's not, it, it, okay, so let's say you collect uh, data and it gives you an alert, something is wrong. What do you do with that, right? What do you do with that? I mean, you have to go to the doctor, right? And the doctor, you're going to come to him and say, listen, this app told me, duh, duh, duh. he's going to throw you out, right? He doesn't have the time. He doesn't know what it does. I mean, how can he act? He doesn't have the tools to act on it, right? So if you really want to make the change there, then it's not enough to collect the data just from the consumer. You have to be you know, to find a way to make that data available and accepted and actionable for the physicians. And, and I think this is the shift we're going to see. Sure. Hi. I'm Limor, <laughs> a, a product owner of mobile apps at Proninger. Um, you described kind of a long process of um, developing and releasing, and I would be very much interested to know what is your approach regarding failure. So what happens when you were working for, I don't know, half a year or a year on a feature and it failed? So it's not converting, the data is not accurate, what do you do? Do you roll back or... How do you do that? Well, it happens a lot, right? Because in an innovation center, that's part of the process, and you have to accept it. And it's interesting because I had an interview with a developer that wanted to move to our team, and he said, oh, you know, we're working on this team, and, you know, we're working on things, and I don't know if they'll succeed, and I want to move to your team. And I told him, listen, um, you're in an innovation center, so maybe you move to another team, but still, failing is a big part of what we do. I mean, if 20% of the stuff we do is actually successful, then this is great. I mean, that's what we're aiming at, but that means that 80% of it is a failure. So, of course, that won't stick in the big products where you develop stuff, but in the innovation, you're, you're going into new domains, so you don't know, you experiment. So, I think that is really part of the culture there. You accept it. I mean, you always learn something from it, right? So the next time you're going to be better, hopefully, and not repeat the same mistakes, but have new ones. So. But do you roll back? Uh, okay, so that's why we have certain stages. So we have the co-innovation project, and then when we decide to productize, there's this new channel that we are now working with, which is called release, called release to incubation. So what happens is that you have a limited release up to one year, you can extend it maybe to 18 months, and after that you decide, is it going to be a standard product or do you stop it? Because in SAP, if you release something, then you're committed to at least five years to support it, and if you then discover that it doesn't work, then it's more painful. So this way we can kind of contain it and say, okay, we try for 12 months. If it doesn't work, I guess we should stop it. We have one more minute. Hi, this is uh, Martin from Minds and Makers. I was wondering, um, you were talking about, I understand, like the services you uh, develop. You need to study a lot of stakeholders or, let's say, a lot of users. But how do you ensure that the, the user perspective is always um, present in the development process? Because a lot of times, this product development teams are, there's not a user researcher, for example, who is there every time to ensure that that the needs are, uh, are covered? How, how do you ensure that? Right, so we actually have a quite a big UX and design team that are very engaged in the projects, um, are part of the meetings with the customers, and really make sure that they do the re user research, um, and they are also part of the development team, but also the developers themselves go to visit the customers and are part of these sessions. And again, this is something that is kind of more unique to the innovation center. And this is also something that we really put emphasis on when we recruit people. So I think in some teams in the past, I wouldn't have been able to do that because I didn't have the right people. But now one of the criteria we have when we look for new developers is someone that would be interested, willing, and able to engage with customers and talk to them and understand them because especially it, for new products, it's very, very important to have that direct connection. 
on time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all could take something away from that session. Um, I wish you a nice second half of the day. Um, enjoy Digital Leute Summit. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.